um, guests joining us. We've got about 100 people on the call this evening. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining us this evening for this very special event as part of Marymount University's week of celebrations in honor of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Before we begin our program this evening, I'd like to just take care of a couple of housekeeping items. First, this program is being recorded. So if you do not wish to be on the recording, you may turn off your video. It will be posted to Cody's YouTube channel next week. Um, the format of the program this evening will involve speaker introductions, 45 minutes of conversation between our speakers and 15 minutes of questions at the end of the hour. We ask that guests keep themselves muted for the duration of the conversation. If you have questions during the course of the program, please place your questions in the chat and we will address them during the Q&A portion of the evening. I will also add resources to the chat for your reference. My name is Caitlin Berry. I'm the director of Cody Gallery here at Marymount and I'm coming to you live from the gallery right now. I'm delighted to present our conversation this evening in collaboration with Marymount's Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Thank you to Brooke Berry, Dean of Students, Equity and Inclusion for you and your team's effort to bring this event to life. Brooke, would you like to say a few words about your office and the programming this week? Uh, my office is thrilled to be partnering with you and the Cody Gallery to bring uh, this event tonight. And this event is one in a series of events um, that we are having in, um, to celebrate and honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, we're so excited to expose our community to such a powerful exhibit. Um, and we are just happy to center the experiences of the oppressed of Black women and Black creatives. And we're hopeful that everyone leaves here feeling inspired uh, and ready to challenge the status quo in their own lives. Um, also this week, our office will be opening officially a Center of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for our Marymount students. So we're hopeful in the days to come that once you uh, leave the Boston Center visiting the Cody Gallery, you'll be able to come over to main campus and visit us in the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Center. Thank Thanks, you, Caitlin. Um, you know, after a, a really tough year for our nation, it's my hope that these kinds of collaborative events can bring healing and dialogue to the Marymount community and beyond. Um, as youth poet laureate Amanda Gorman so beautifully said at yesterday's presidential inauguration, if we only dare it because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It is the past we step into and how we repair it. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome everyone to Magnolia, an intimate conversation with Nikisha Durrett and India Beale. This program takes place on the occasion of Nikisha Durrett's solo exhibition at Cody Gallery. Durrett seeks to hold space for black women, not only to be seen, but celebrated as worthy of justice, gender parity, and inclusion in the narratives they so profoundly inform. Durrett's work often materializes on a monumental scale through public art and installations addressing marginalized communities and their histories. In this exhibition, the artist presents a more intimate experience, calling viewers to engage with the stories and lives of 30 women murdered by law enforcement, using the magnolia leaf as metaphor. Direct currently lives and works in Washington, DC, where she creates bold and playful large-scale installations and public art that aim to make the ordinary enchanting and awe-inspiring while summoning subject matter that is often hidden from plain sight. She earned her BFA at the Cooper Union in New York City and MFA from the University of Michigan School of Art and Design as a Horace H. Rackham Fellow. Her work has been exhibited widely and she has been the recipient of multiple project grants. Durrett was a finalist in the National Portrait Gallery's prestigious Outwin Bushiver Portrait Competition and was featured in the Outwin 2019 American Portraiture Today. In 2020, Durrett was a contributing artist to the Times Square Arts, Poster House, Print Magazine, and Four Freedoms Citywide Public Art Campaign, featuring artist designed PSAs and messages of love, gratitude, and solidarity with New York City's healthcare and essential workers. She re recently completed a permanent installation on the glass walled vestibule in the newly renovated Martin Luther King Jr. Library in Washington, DC. 
I'm delighted to announce that she has been commissioned to create a large scale permanent public artwork for a new park in Arlington, Virginia. I'm also pleased to welcome the leader of our conversation this evening, the brilliant India Beale, who's joining us from our hometown, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. India is a North Carolina-based artist, curator, and author. Beale's work merges fine arts and social injustice. She uses photography and video to reveal the often overlooked and unappreciated experiences unique to people of color. Specifically, Beale's first monograph, Performance Review, brings together work over a 10-year period that highlights and the realities and challenges for women of color in the corporate workplace. She lectures about these experiences, which also addresses bias in corporate hiring practices. Beale is featured in several online editorials, including the New York Times and BET. She also appeared in Time Magazine, Essence, and Marie Claire, among others. Her work has been exhibited in several institutions. She is a fellow of the Center for Curatorial Leadership and completed residencies at Harvard Art Museums, the Center for Photography at Woodstock and McCall Center for Art and Innovation. Beale has received grants from several organizations. She holds a dual BFA in art history and studio art from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MFA from Yale University. Thank you ladies so much for being with us today. And I invite you to take the floor to begin your conversation. Thank you, Kaylin, so much. Um, first and foremost, I wanna just say it's such a privilege to be here with you all this evening and have this conversation. So thank you to the Cody Gallery. Thank you, Brooke, uh, for initiating this conversation and dialogue. Um, and it's such an honor to have this conversation with the amazing Nikisha Durrett. Um, and Nikisha, you know, before we start, um, I would like to ask you all to do a favor for me. I want you all to pull out your phones and I would like you to follow Nikisha Durrett on Instagram. So right now, pull out your phones, follow Nikisha on Instagram, follow Cody Gallery, follow You Belong MU on Instagram right now. And we'll actually put the names in the chat so you'll be able to see the spelling and make sure you can find them. And you may say, India, why? Why are we following them on Instagram? Because I believe in order to uplift, encourage, inspire, and move forward the voices that need to be heard, we have to support the platforms. So right now, take two seconds, pull out your phones, follow these artists and organizations on Instagram so that we can continue to uplift, inspire, and motivate the work that they're making so other people will see the greatness that we're going to see today. Uh, so, you know, Nikisha, um, when I was thinking about your, your work, I know we originally talked about uh, Zora Neale Hurston and uh, the novel, Their Eyes Are Watching God. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate Caitlin quoting Amanda Gorman, who presented yesterday. I'm still on a high from yesterday, uh, thinking about uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and even Amanda Gorman's poem which I think cannot be read enough. And so I'm actually gonna say a few lines from that poem because when I thought about your work and these magnolia leaves, I thought about the amazing things that you are doing in relation to her voice. So I'm gonna read just a small, small sentence from that poem. She says, we will rebuild, reconcile and recover. And every known nook in our nation, every corner um, called our country, our people diverse and beautiful, we emerge battered and beautiful. When days come, we'll step out of the shade, out of the flame, unafraid, for there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it, if only enough, we are brave enough to be it. And I think about your leaves, Nikisha, and this light that's shining through, illuminating the names of all these women who were murdered by police. And when we think about light, lots of times we think about the positivity of light, this glow. But I think what Amanda Gorman was saying and also what you're saying is that this light also shines the negativity as well. The passion, the batterness that we've experienced as a country, as a people, as women of color. And so to start off our conversation, I wanna talk about this light, um, this history, this visibility that's in your work that's so ever present. And so can you talk, start talking about, I guess, your inspiration, um, these themes of history and visibility that we see within this work that you're making right now? Um, thank you for that um, introduction, India. Um, 
and for giving me that uh, India effect boost on my Instagram <laughs> profile. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting before we um, before we started the program, I was thinking about that the handle for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Marymount is you belong. And I think it's really important to take a moment to think about why that handle is called you belong. Why do we still need to say that? Um, and I think that that um, question um, is, or that sentiment is behind a lot of the work that I make. Um, I think that a lot of my work kind of is birthed out of, um, out of absence, um, looking out into the world and um, not seeing myself, um, not, not seeing the world that I perceive it to be, um, and thinking about how um, I often feel like I'm making work for, you know, like my eight-year-old self who was like always kind of looking for herself out in the world and like who wanted to feel like, like she belonged. Um, so yeah, I think that runs, that's the kind of a thread that runs through everything really, um, you know, and thinking about the provenance of this work of Magnolia, it's, or any work that I do, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly where the inspiration started. I mean, I can go all the way back to um, undergraduate and thinking about my favorite foundation class, which was color and learning about all of these visual phenomena, um, phenomena of color and what happens physically to your eye when you stare into light or when you stare into two opposing colors and, and then you close your eyes or you look away. And what happens is, is that you, when you look away, you still, you see the inverse of that image um, in, in your sight line. Um, and it's called an after image. Um, so it's, I think it's partly uh, self-preservation that when I'm working on projects, um, I don't think so much about how, how much it actually makes sense. So, and that usually all comes kind of crashing down on me like the night before a show opens. So I woke up like uh, the other night in the, like the night before the work was being installed. And I was like panic stricken because I'm like, oh my God, I'm asking people to stare into this bright light to look at these leaves. And, um, and then, and I kind of sat with that for a while and I, and where I landed was that, well, for one, I'm not going to redo this artwork like the night before I'm installing it. Um, but I'm also thinking that, wow, how incredible is that, that somehow like that a person's, um, a part of a person's body is physically altered by looking, by staring into this work. And that for a few brief moments, when they blink, when they close their eyes and they're no longer looking at this artwork, they still see these women's names. So it's like this way of like, um, etching their names into the, the retinas of the viewer. Um, so it's this passive aggressive way of saying, you can't look away. You look away and we're still here. I love that. And, and you know, speaking of the names, which I thought was so profound, like we can think about the trial of Breonna Taylor and we know these, this is kind of a, a name that has been mentioned, but many of the names were new to me. When I, when I read them for the first time. So can we talk, can you talk a little bit about process and how you went about finding these women's names um, and, and selecting which women you decided to, um, to put on the Magnolia? To Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, I, I first learned about Kimberly Crenshaw in um, probably too late, you know, it was around uh, 2015, 2016. And um, it was just before the inauguration 
of our former president, whose name I will not say. Um, and um, I was teaching a cultural studies class and I was teaching my students about, about race. We were learning about implicit bias and they took the implicit bias test. And, um, and um, we also learned about intersectionality. And a lot of times, interestingly, I'm kind of learning right along with my students. I see something that's really interesting to me. I hear a new word. I see, I learn about a new artist and I'm so excited about it that I just, I just want to share it with them. Um, so I kind of started uh, following Kimberly Crenshaw then, um, who is a lawyer and who is the executive director of the African American Policy Forum. And I know that all of you have heard the hashtag say her name. Well, Kimberly Crenshaw created say her name. And she also invented the word intersectionality and intersectionality, um, just for, I have a lot of students who are here today. Um, intersectionality is what is sort of what, what happened when you uh, happen to be um, black and queer or black and poor or um, black and a woman. It's, you know, those things converge and your experience is kind of, um, it's, it's uh, multiplied, it's amplified. Um, so yeah, so I, um, you know, have been knowing about the Say Her Name movement and Kimberly Crenshaw for a really long time. And I just can, I can remember showing her TED talk to my students and hearing her call out those names and like, you know, she was called out the names of black men who had been murdered by police and, you know, ever, had everyone raise their hand if they had heard of that person. And then when she started naming women, like no one raised their hand. And that was so profound and that just really stuck with me. But again, like that was back in 20, 2016. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there, as artists, we kind of, um, we live in the world and we take these things in and, and sometimes it's hard to, it's, it's hard to identify what makes all those things kind of, all those puzzle pieces kind of fit together. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was kind of where it started for me. And, um, so on her, on this website, on the, um, the African American Policy Forum website, there is a list of, um, of women who have been murdered by police. Um, it is, there's not a lot of data around, um, around these cases. Some of these cases don't even get to see the light of day. Right. Um, so, um, you know, my mom was asking me earlier, like, how many women are there? That how many black women are there that have been? Honestly, like, there's not a, there's not a, a there's not a ton of information that that um, there's not a ton of research behind it, and so, and that in itself speaks volumes. The silence around these names speaks volumes. I know earlier when we talked, we did talk about. I told you about Zora Neale Hurston and how I thought about her work when I first looked at this body. Um, in the book, Their Eyes Are Watching God, there's a quote where one of the main characters says, uh, the black women are the mules of the earth. And when you hear that, you're like, ooh, the mules. And, but what the mule represents victimization, bondage, uh, you know, the search for independence in this character. And uh, many people don't know that Zora Neale Hurston sourced um, her information from interviews she did back in 1935 from enslaved peoples or children who whose parents were enslaved. And those interviews that she did kind of fueled um, the book, Their Eyes Are Watching God. And so when I looked at this work, I thought about these women. And like you said, many of them, um, their stories have never been told. Their voices, their names have never been, have never been stated before. And so in your work, a lot of the work you did, whether it's at Walter Reed, um, Hospital in the Lawn, uh, where your sister was born, can you talk about this theme of history and why it's so important in terms of the work you make and looking back and really thinking about those narratives? Can you say a little bit more about that as well? 
Um, I think about that a lot, actually. Um, I don't feel that there's a such thing as looking back to history. Um, I, you know, my wife is a psychotherapist. Um, I uh, have a therapist myself. And one of the things I've heard a lot, like just having conversations with my wife and it's like with my therapist is that like, is that trauma? Um, it lives in the body. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go away. Like there's no such thing as the past really, because it lives in our bodies. It's etched in our nervous systems. Um, I think I read somewhere that I think it's like 17 generations or something like that of, um, of, of trauma can be etched in our, in our nervous systems. So for me, like there's just no, the past is the present and the present is what, is what we have, you know? Right, right, right. Uh, you know, when we talked, you talked about this dual pandemic. You said, Indy, we have two pandemics happening right now. Mm -hmm. We have COVID uh, as a pandemic, and then we have a pandemic that's happening in terms of uh, inequalities, systematic inequalities that are happening across the board. And, you know, I, I think about, um, you know, Vice President, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, but also uh, Amanda Gorman. And that's, that's, that's one story of black women, but there's a whole nother story of black women that hasn't been told before, right? And I think you and I are both searching for those untold truths, searching for those stories. And when I'm making even my own work, I think about my audience. Mm -hmm. Who am I making this work for? Who do I want to be invested in this? Who do I want to see this and experience these photographs that I'm making? And so can you talk a little bit about your audience in terms of this work that's on display right now at the Cody Gallery? You know, who, who, who are you making this work for essentially? And what do you want people to get from this work um, when they enter it, when they have an opportunity to see it in person? Yeah. Uh, this is probably gonna be kind of a rambling answer because like, <laughs> that's such a good question. Um, I, well, you mentioned Amanda Gorman, um, and what, like, I just want to say, like, what a, just an incredible, um, refreshing spectacle that was, you know, that she was in that little body. Um, I think about all of the all of the young people who are going to be so inspired by that moment to see her like that is so that is such a powerful um, it's just so powerful to be seen. There's so much power in that. Um, so. I'm often thinking about people who aren't seen. Um, uh, just a little story. Um, when I was talking to Caitlin the other day, um, who just had that lo lovely introduction of the both of us, um, she mentioned that there was a, um, a that a security guard had let her into the space, and that um, you know he was just kind of kind of, you know, milling around the gallery a little bit and just kind of seemed like maybe, you know, like he didn't want to leave. And so um, she said, you want me to turn the, turn the work on for you so you can see it. And um, she, she turned the work on and, and he stayed there for a while. I think she said he stayed there for, for five minutes, which is a long time actually. And like, in like, in terms of like viewing artwork, like five minutes is actually quite, a, quite a while. Um, and I like having, having worked in museums um, and having, uh, you know, had like rapport with um, custodial staff and um, security folks. Like those are folks that I see, like I, I see my family in those people. Um, they're safeguarding the museum. Um, they're watching over the collections. They have this huge role and no one sees them, but they see everything. 
Um, I love like some of my favorite moments are like going to a museum and like a security guard will pull me aside and be like, well, this was like, you know, in the before times, but a security guard pull me aside and like give me some inside scoop about the artist when they came in to install the work. Um, so I love the idea that someone enters this space where they typically don't feel seen, they don't feel um, called out, they don't see themselves on the wall, but suddenly there's this, like somebody is speaking to them. I mean, I'm speaking to everybody, but I'm acknowledging a part of their experience that maybe they've never seen on a on a museum wall. And so that's kind of I think where where I'm coming from quite a bit. Especially, I mean, I just feel like speaking of the pandemic and the before times, like I feel like this has given me an opportunity to really kind of focus what it is that I'm saying and and who I'm addressing and why and those questions that I struggled with for a really long time. No, I love that when you when you were talking, it made me think about, and for the students out there, I, I highly recommend that you write down these names <laughs> so that you're able to capture them as well. Uh, Roy Decarava, a photographer said, to know me is to know my art, to know my art is to know me. And I think that you see yourself in so much of, so much of the work that you're making. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you a little bit about um, your relationships and, and, and building, because there's so many students on this call right now. Uh, many times we see the final product and uh, Caitlin will give us a kind of close up view soon so we are able to see the final product, but I, I wanna talk about relationships. You know, in the art world in particular, um, it's built on relationships like many fields and many artists of color are, are unable to navigate this network that in many ways was never designed for artists of color to thrive. Right. And so we have a select few of artists who've gotten opportunities in order to to show their work. But many artists, many female artists, many black artists are still struggling um, to enter this world, this art world that you and I um, find ourselves in. And so I want you to talk about a little bit about um, how you were able to create your platform, who helped you along the way in order to do that, because I'm a strong believer, we did not do it by ourselves, right? There was always, I know your parents are on the call. <laughs> so shout out to uh, the direct. <laughs> but, um, but also thinking about who else was a part of your life um, in the field um, that, that helped you along the way in discovering your voice. Yeah, um, I mean, I really do want to, I want to personally call out my parents because I mean, it's it's really true. I mean, they, when I didn't see, aside from Jimmy J.J. Walker, you know, like on Good Times, I'm dating myself, <laughs> but, uh, you know, aside from Jimmy J.J. Walker, like I didn't see any Black artists. I didn't see, I just didn't see that in the world. So it must have been terrifying, I would imagine, for my parents to like hear me say that I wanted to be an artist. Like, what does that mean? Like, how are you going to, how are you going to survive being an artist? Like, how does that happen? Like, maybe you should study something more practical. Like they could have said that, like, no, you need to like study business or you need to blah, blah, blah. But they just from jump were just like, where do we sign you up? What classes do you need to take? Where do you need to be? Um, they pushed me, um, you know, helped me get my portfolio together. They talked to folks to see what I needed in my portfolio, um, got me enrolled at Duke Ellington School, School of the Arts, where I now teach, but I'm also an alum. Um, and, you know, and then fast forward, uh, you know, had I, and I mean, I think about like, had I not gone to Duke Ellington, I just, I would not have known about art schools, like which art school to go to, what it meant to go to art school, how to find them, how to apply, how to, you know, I just, I remember my Mel Davis, my painting teacher, you know, I told him that I was, I was getting a little, for some reason, I don't know, I was getting a little disenchanted or something with the art, with art or something like that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be a, a vet. I'm going to be, I was like, I'm going to be a veterinarian. I'm applying to Vassar. And 
he was like, no, what are you talking about? He's like, you are going to Cooper Union. And Cooper Union was like, the that was like pie in the sky. Like, you know, the most competitive art school, free tuition if you get, you know, merit-based scholarship if you get accepted. I was like, I don't know, but he believed in me and like, and I applied and I got in. Um, and, you know, in that school, Duke Ellington School of the Arts was founded by Peggy Cooper Kafritz, who I didn't meet while I was a student there. Um, but after I finished graduate school, I came back to DC and I um, made some work. There was in a show in a local gallery in DC, uh, Flashpoint Gallery. And the Washingtonian, the Washingtonian magazine did this like 40 under 40 piece. And she saw me in there and it said that I was, that I had attended Duke Ellington School of the Arts. And she found my number somehow or my email. Maybe, I think she called a magazine. I don't know, but she found me and invited me over to her house. And was very curious about the ideas behind my work and my process and when my next show was and who else did I know in the area? Like she always wanted to know like who was the hot, you know, up and coming artist. So she was asking me like, who else should she know? And she came to my opening um, and uh, she collected some of my work. Um, that was huge. That was huge for me. Um, I think about, you know, there are a ton of people on this call that I mean, Corinne Miller, I saw her and I don't want to call out too many people because then I, like, I don't want to miss anybody, but um, so many people, I mean, DC has been so, so very, so very good to me. And, you know, even thinking about Caitlin and, you know, I was just standing at the airport in the before times, we were at the airport and we were kind of standing, I think she was standing behind me or in front of me. And she's kind of looked over me and she was like, are you going down to Miami for Art Basel? I was like, <laughs> I was like yeah, I am. <laughs> and uh, we just started chit-chatting and I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to be uh, unveiling a sculpture down there that I did in collaboration with Hank Willis Thomas, who is one of my oldest friends who I went to um, high school with. And um, I invited her to the unveiling and I was like, she's not gonna come. It wasn't even like a waiting for Guffman kind of thing. Like I was just like, I got that out of my mind and she showed up, she came. Um, that was huge. And that led to this show with this work that is so like at that time in that moment in time, I had no idea I was gonna make this work. I was not at all thinking about making this work. And to be here, you know, like having this, this show, like exactly how I envisioned it in this space is pretty incredible. Um, it's just so much. I remember uh, when I met uh, Jordan Amarcani, I don't know, I'm not sure if she's on this call, but I know my friend Jen Sichel is, and she's the reason why both of, about why we met is Jen invited me out for drinks and, um, I showed up at the at the at the restaurant, plopped down in the chair and was like chit chatting. And all of a sudden, this woman comes up behind me and she's like, just looking at me, like kind of giving me this look. Like, and I realized I was sitting in her chair. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I get a oh, she's like, no, 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 you can sit there. It's okay, it's okay. Just let me get my keys or some my wallet out of my out of my coat. I was all, not only was I sitting in her chair, I was crushing her coat. I was sitting on her coat. <laughs> and then like I laughed or something and spilled like my cocktail into her purse. And my cocktail line was in her bag. And that's just kind of this crazy way that I met this curator who like a couple years later would invite me to be a part of the Atlanta Biennial, which Years ago, I remember going in the early 2000s and thinking, God, I would love to be in the show. So it's just like, you just never know. It's like so important. I, I tell this to my students and they're like, don't be an a-hole. <laughs> you know, the thing I love about the stories you just told are that they transcend race. So, you know, 
um, you know, you spoke, you spoke to different people, but they were of different races who all kind of helped you build the foundation of your practice in some way. You know, right now uh, in the country, organizations are having a reckoning with their role in systematic inequalities. And they're trying to figure out the best way to move forward the best way to show that what they're doing isn't just in vogue, but they actually have a genuine and passionate desire to want to change. I mean, even myself, I think about my own story and so many, um, Jeff Whitestone, a white male photographer who was assisting me in getting into Yale, right? So these individuals who, who just saw the, the kind of value and the vision that you had and wanted to move that forward. So I actually have the question for you is, when you think about these corporations, galleries in particular, uh, museums, art museums, who are trying to not necessarily um, change or erase the past, but really thinking about the future and ways to make their own platforms more diverse, to create a way that they can talk about issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in a more meaningful way, uh, that can show work like yours and create the conversations that need to be had. Uh, what steps do you think these galleries and museums can take to show that they're genuine in terms of wanting to create systematic change and, and showing that art museums are a part and partners in this cause um, to move forward? Yes, a fantastic question, India. And um, it hits a little close to home. Um, you know, um, I'm an artist at, at, at Stable and, you know, we've kind of been in our own kind of, mode, you know, this kind of mode of like uh, reckoning and just all that, what all these other agencies are, are going through, like, how do you, you know, striking the right message and um, being sincere about it and in all of that, um, you know, sitting in DEI, a lot of DEI trainings and, and, and all of that. Um, and I think that where it all starts, it's like, it's like you said, like there were all these people along the way who were helping you um, of, of, like across race. And like, and that is like, that is very much my story. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, like we're like, we're having these DEI trainings and I know that there are like, grown people who are just learning that like a race is a construct like I'm not you know I'm not just talking like specifically about stable or anything but I'm just talking about in general like across the country there are grown people who are like like they're not like willfully ignorant or anything they're really like literally just learning that race is made up um so it oh my gosh there, it's just so much a part of the atmosphere, the smog that we've all breathed our entire life. So there are people who are upholding these structures of white supremacy who are good people. Like they don't even realize it. Some of those people might not even be white. Um, so, this is like, this is a moment in time when um, everyone, no matter what you do, no matter what industry you're in, you have to take a look at who is at the table and who's not at the table. Those people who are the most harm are the ones should be, who should be taking up the most space at those tables. I love that. And I told you I was going to ask you some some tough questions as well. So <laughs> this is this is my tough one for you. No pressure, kind of. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you. A lot of times you put together these panels, and you're talking about some of the DE and I panels, and I've been on a few myself. And and unfortunately, sometimes I get on these panels and I look around. I'm like, why is everybody black, <laughs> right? Like everybody is black on my panel like we're talking about diversity yeah there is no diversity in this panel that i'm talking to right now um and sometimes we have these conversations and i'm thinking i want to ask the artists that i get a chance to talk to who are making this important work if you could put a panel of leaders in art living because i know you <laughs> uh, okay. together if you could put a panel together 
of living either museum directors, curators, artists, if you could put a panel together, who would it be? And what's one question you wanna ask in terms of creating real change in our field uh, where so many voices of women of color are just not heard even today? Um, who would those people be and who would you ask? And that's a hard question, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they wouldn't be any black people. Huh? There wouldn't be any black people on it. <laughs> who would it be? <laughs> um, you know, and I thought about that question and I couldn't think of like a list of people, but like what I did and I brought it out, what I did think of, I, I thought of this, um, and I, I can't remember, I don't, maybe my parents gave me this, I can't remember, or my cousin, like I can't remember, but um, it's this, uh, I know it's like backwards now, but it's the art game. And it's this little like, it's this little card game. It's very cute. Um, and they've got these cool little illustrations of all these artists on it. And it says on the back, it says, Piet Mondrian or Damien Hirst, Jackson Pollock or David Hockney, whose artworks have been the most influential, the most shocking, the most expressive? How about their versatility or critical reception? These playing cards allow art lovers of all ages to play their favorite artists against each other to discover who rules the art world. And with the exception, and they put like the one, the one black person, Michelle Boss. <laughs> they okay. put him on the cover. And there's also one woman, I think it's Cindy Sherman on here. And there's a couple of other women in there, you know, Frida Kahlo, you know, she's kind of a catch-all, put her in there. Um, but like someone has decided, like throughout history, like who is important. And who isn't? Like, who gets left out? Who rules the art world? We know who rules the art world. That's got to change. So um, that would be my question to them. How do we change that? How do we, you know, how does the eight-year-old eight -year little girl that looks like me, how does she see herself in this deck of playing cards? Because this is cute. I'd like to see myself in there. I love it. And, and speaking of seeing yourself, I don't know if I can um, ask Miss Caitlin Berry if we can see some of the beautiful work uh, in the gallery. Um, that would just be amazing if we could see some of, uh, like Roy Decarava said, to know, to know me is to know my work and to know my work is to know me. And so we're getting to see a little, a little bit of Nikisha right now uh, in, in terms of this work, yeah. Ah. Nikisha, one thing uh, maybe you could speak to is um, the, the way these are constructed and the, the velvet liners you've chosen. Yeah. Um, so I guess I should talk a little about um, how this all came to be because I kind of skipped around. I kind of got into like the whole, like conceptual part of it, but even just like the materiality of the thing, like how did I decide on the the leaf? How did I choose the velvet? How did the boxes? All of that. Um, so I have been holding on to a magnolia leaf for a while. I think that my curiosity about it kind of started. Um, maybe it was in twenty sixteen. Um, I was working on another piece where I was using kind of material, like natural uh, materials. And um, I, I was looking at the, I came across a magnolia pod, the little seed pod. And I thought that was cool. And I was going to incorporate it into this piece that I was working on. But then I realized that they were like, it was possible for all these little like there were all these little insects that had that were living inside of them. And so they started kind of taking over my studio and I was like, oh, I gotta get rid of these. Um, so, but I still had these magnolia leaves and I noticed like I just had them for a couple of years and I realized like they just didn't break down. Like they were just really, they weren't like a oak leaf or something like that, which gets kind of like, you know, it kind of crumbles up over time. And, you know, they're just kind of, mm -hmm. they're extremely fragile. Um, and, oh, I see myself now. Okay. Um, and, uh, so I was like, gosh, there's gotta be something that I can do 
uh, with this leaf. And so I just kind of like had it sitting on my desk for a long time. And then I bought this like hole punching tool for a different project. Um, it was actually not even for the artwork itself, really. It was to make a template and it's this, uh, material, this, uh, tool. I think I, I don't have it here anymore. Um, but oh, here it is. Yeah, just this thing. And it has these different sized, uh, nibs on it. And you can, uh, you know, punch holes in paper and leather, like leather, leather makers use this uh, tool a lot. And so I... It's like, let me see what happens when I punch the magnolia leaf. And so I punched the magnolia leaf and it like made this like perfect hole. And there was just like great kind of juxtaposition of this like perfectly, you know, this like perfectly made circle into this leaf. And it kind of made me think of um, uh, like, uh, what are the ends? Like, like beetles that, that chew into leaves and leave the little holes. And so, you know, I was kind of thinking about like, it's like kind of funny. And I was trying to think of like something like humorous that I could kind of do with that. You know, it's like, I think there's always just kind of a little bit of humor in the work a little bit. And so um, just thinking about these, you know, these beetles that have a brain and somehow they're like, you know, carving these like messages into the leaves or images or whatever, which is kind of funny to me. Um, and so, but I kind of like shelved it for a while. I think I, I heard, um, uh, um, Amy Sherald, I was listening to an interview with Amy Sherald and she says that, that she puts, uh, like titles for her work. She puts them into a jar just so she can remember them and she just kind of pulls them out of the jar. And so I started doing that with my ideas as I realized the older I get, the harder, it, the harder it is for me to think of, to remember my ideas, like to hold on to them. So I kept this jar putting ideas and, and, um, I, long story short, um, there was an exhibit that I was going to be in in New York, and uh, the pandemic hit. Couldn't create that work, um, and because I had to make work from home, so I started thinking about that leaf again. Like that's small, I can sit at my dining room table, and I started thinking about that tool again. And so then it just started. And then George Floyd was murdered, and. Um, I realized, like, I had that thought, like, I had this deep, like, obviously this deep sadness and anger over, for what had happened and, like, what keeps happening. And then always, like, where my mind eventually goes is, like, I just notice that women aren't ever, like, a part of this conversation or, like, or they're a part of the conversation, but it's kind of, you know, peripheral. Like, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't, evoke like the same amount of emotion in people as it does is when men are murdered. And so I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, to create this project. I wanted to, I realized I wanted, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to etch these names into the leaves. And um, also around the same time, what brought me back to the Magnolia Leaf is that I was taking these walks to the cemetery in my neighborhood. And, um, yeah, and just thinking about all the loss and the pandemic and and all of that, and it just all kind of clicked together. Um, and so, uh, you know, I knew that these leaves needed to be backlit. That was the only way you were going to be able to see them. And I was just kind of photographing them at my dining room table, posting them on Instagram, and then just gradually kind of thinking about how I would display them. And so I started talking to people, talking about relationships, like people that I know who are um, you know, lighting, um, lighting designers and framers and just trying to figure out how to create this artwork. Um, and I knew that I wanted it to look kind of organic. Um, so, you know, thinking about like the wood grain and all of that, and then thinking about uh, a casket and thinking about the care of these fragile leaves and um, how, you know, if you were going to pick out like the perfect casket for someone, like what would it look like? And, um, so that's kind of where the velvet came from. Like, I felt like the velvet kind of felt like 
I was talking to someone who said that these pieces were huggable. I can't remember who that was. Like, it just like, you just, they're like the right size. You feel like you want to hug them. And um, I felt like the, the velvet kind of did that as well. It's just like soft and tactile and, um, you know, black women aren't thought of as being soft. Like we always have to be strong. And you know, I love that. I love when you're talking about the kind of toughness of the outside and this velvety inside. And I love the fact that you mentioned that you were sitting at your dining room table, you know, and because of the pandemic, you had to kind of reposition the work you were going to make and thinking about other works and works you're going to make at a time where you weren't able to go out in the world. And so uh, with that, and we're gonna open it up to everyone to ask questions again. Thank you so much for putting questions in the chat. Um, but to end, Nikisha, can you tell me, you know, at this time, how do you remain motivated? Uh, for these young artists, you say you talk about your eight-year-old self, and I know you have a number of students on this call and um, there's so much happening in the world right now and we're not connected the way we want to be. We're not being able to hug each other uh, the way we would want to. And so how do you remain motivated right now in terms of your work and your practice? Um, what is some advice you would give to artists who are trying to make work and like photographers like myself, we're trying to go out in the world and we can't. And so we're making work in different ways. Um, what would you recommend and what is your advice to these young artists right now? Um, I think I'm going to kind of answer one of the other questions that we talked about earlier in like in answering this question, um, which is like, does art have the power to bring about like systemic change? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm reminded of this story. So I, one of the things that I did, I was researching for this project that's in Arlington. Now I try to keep this short. Um, and in doing so, like I wanted to kind of think about uh, Black spirituality and Black churches. And I came across this beautiful um, like podcast series that the Smithsonian Folkways did in collaboration with NPR. And it was called Wade in the water and there were all these beautiful, not only do you get to hear all of these beautiful, um, powerful moving um, spirituals, but you get to hear the backstory about them. And there was this one story about um, We Shall Overcome, which I'm sure we all know this song, but somebody at some point made that song up. And now that song is like a part of our like our bloodstream, but there's this um, young woman at the time in the 60s who was named, uh, whose name was Jamila Jones. And she was a, a freedom singer. She was an activist. And she, they were, she was with some other activists. They were in this um, school and it was at night and they were kind of having a down, kind of down, like relaxing kind of moment. They were watching a movie all of a sudden cops show up because they're not supposed to be like congregating, like this is very suspicious activity. So these cops come in and they've got their billy clubs and they got their guns and everything. And they uh, suddenly, without warning, they turn the lights out. So it's at night, it's completely dark. Like everyone's like, what is about to happen? In the crowd, there's this woman who just starts singing, like in the mix and the people are there. She starts singing, we shall overcome. Mm -hmm. Cops hated it. They hated it when black people would sing together because they knew what that was doing. It was bringing about this power, a collective power. And so Jamila Jones, who also has this beautiful voice, she does this ad lib and she says, we are not afraid. We are not afraid. And the cop gets right, it's dark now. The cop gets in her face and is like, if you have to sing, do you have to sing so loud? And she said that that just provoked her to sing even louder. And she was like, we are not afraid. And they retreated. The cops retreated. So 
I heard that story and it just made me think like, wow, the power of art the awesome power of art. And that's like, that's the word that I talk about with my students a lot, this word about awe. And there was a study that was done about awe and how awe um, inspires community, collective effort. If you experience something that feels larger than yourself, something you can't explain, beauty, something's equal parts beautiful, equal parts sad, um, it, there is this power in this. And I think that once you realize that you have the capacity to do that, especially in places where you don't like, and there are other places where you don't feel that you have that power. Like if you can harness that, then that is like, just pretty motivating. I mean, that like, yeah, like making this work and putting it out in the world and realizing that like, wow, people are paying attention. Like people, um, people are remembering these names. Like people, because I have taken this, these things that don't go together, a magnolia leaf and the name of a black woman, they don't go together, but they do now. And I can't tell you how many messages I've gotten from people who are like, oh man, there's this magnolia tree that I used to pass every day and I never thought about it. And now like, I think about these women when I see that tree, but that is like, that is so powerful. Like I can make you think about that. Like, man, that is crazy. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, everything you said is so, I hope the students took away as much as I took away from that story. Um, so moving, so powerful. I think about the the magnolia trees at Renolda House in Winston Salem, where I live. Uh, they are breathtakingly beautiful, um, and I just think about. And you're right; you don't think magnolia leaves and black women, right? And I think about this gigantic tree that's been there forever that is just uh, has so much glory in it, and it's tough and it's velvety, right? All at the same time. <laughs> Uh, so with that, you know, I, I want to open it up. I want to make sure we have enough time for people to ask questions. And I guess I'll pass it to you, Caitlin. Um, and maybe we can answer a few questions for you guys. Um, you know, Thank we you have so time. much, India and Nikisha, for this wonderful conversation. Um, India, I know the tree you are talking about at <laughs> Ronaldo House. <laughs> this thing, I mean, that's got to be like a hundred-year-old tree or oh, more. Yeah. It's huge. Um, uh, thank you so much for your questions, everyone. Um, we've got quite a few, so I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, let's see. And, you know, uh, either, either of you are welcome to take these questions if you wish, but um, Lydia Thomas asks, how can Caucasian folks or artists best support artists of color? Oh, uh, how can Caucasian artists help Artists of color. Wow, I don't know. <laughs> um, hmm. I think just be curious, like look at, like think about your art history classes. I mean, I think that's where it kind of starts is like a, just appreciation, like at the breadth of like African-American ar artists that have been creating for since forever and how inspiring the work is. I mean, like no one is talking about America the way that black people are talking about America, like the real America. Um, so it's like, I would say like, not just thinking about it as like black versus white, but like these are artists who are telling a really important story about America. Um, and just being curious about that. Like, I, I mean, that's one thing that I felt when I was in art school was that no one was really curious about what I was doing or maybe they were, but didn't know quite how to engage, you know? Yeah. I, I, would, I would add too to that is sharing. You know, so when, when George Floyd was murdered and, uh, 
and all these things were happening around the social injustice and this movement that was taking place. I received so many messages from my white friends about, Indy, are you okay? Like, I'm, I'm just checking in on you. I want to make sure that you're good. And though I appreciated that wholeheartedly, I wanted them to also show their support in other ways, not just through an email from me, but ways in which we can do it on larger platforms. So like I was saying, supporting Nikisha by following her, uh, sharing your thoughts and perspectives so other people know that you are in solidarity with these individuals, that you support them, that you're here for them. And so I think that using our platforms, whether we have one follower, whether we have 2 million followers, um, allows people to see your voice, your thoughts, your insight. And so whether you share your favorite artists, like I went to Nikisha Durrett's talk and it was so good. And here is a picture, you know, sharing that on your platform, but letting people know that you are aware, that you are here, that you are present, and that you are inspired by artists who look different than you, who are foreign from you, right? But you see yourself in their work. And I think that's also really important. Um, from Mary Pruinza, who's the director at uh, Barry Gallery, which is on main campus, our sister gallery. Um, she says, Nikisha, can you talk about um, how you think about the particular color palette of the magnolia leaves and how color can be used metaphorically? Uh, thank you for your show and talk. Mm. And I think you, you touched on this a bit with the Oh, when we talk, yeah, I think we did. I know that you and I, Caitlin, I know that we talked about the the color. So there's the, so there's some, there's a little, a little bit of, there's a lot of color going on. So there's, uh, there are the various shades of the leaves where, you know, I, I think I was just, I can't remember who I was saying this to, but um, I do, I started to see these leaves as like, as the color you know, when after the leaf has fallen and it's changing from green to brown, there are these rich, you know, reddish, uh, orangish hues that like look like my skin color. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was kind of easy for me to kind of make that connection to um, to black women and also like the texture and that they were, you know, the leather on the velvet on one side and all that. Um, and then um, the color of the velvet that is inside of the boxes, there are three different colors. There's blue, there's a gold tone, and there's a red. And I knew that I kind of wanted to choose colors that would kind of set off the, the actual, the colors of, of the leaf, leaf, either contrast with them or kind of match the leaf and bring up some of those colors, punch them up. Um, and also they're just, they're like very regal colors, I think. There's something about them that are just, they just feel kind of like, uh, majestic, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Floy Swatisuk asks, I'd love to hear more on how you approach deciding on a medium, painting, sculpture, installation, etc. Mm, the 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 specificity of the project totally dictates that it really does depend. I'm just kind of very curious about materials and like practices, and I don't like to be boxed in. Um, I'm pretty predictable in other other parts of my life, but uh, I'm a creature of habit. But when it comes to like the studio work, I am kind of all over the place, and I like that. Yeah. Uh, Carl asks, um, I am curious if ritual may play a role in your practice. What may that be and how may it influence your process? Um, definitely. Yeah, definitely ritual definitely is like, there was like a certain time of the day when I would go and, 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 uh, and forage for these leaves. Um, there was a certain type of leaf that I was looking for. Like I knew a good one versus a bad one. And, um, there was a lot of care that went into taking, you know, um, and preserving the leaves, like as I was working for them and kind of, you know, you know, what I was doing to them was pretty aggressive, but there needed to be this kind of gentleness with it as well. Um, I think that ultimately what I was doing was just like, you know, after I thought about it, I mean, the, 
the work requires because it's these delicate leaves, it requires that I be really, um, really careful with them. Um, but at the same, there's metaphor in that too. It's like, I'm giving these leaves the care that these, wom these women should have received moments before they were murdered. Oftentimes these are women who were one unarmed. Um, they are afraid for their lives. They were in emotional or mental distress. Um, what they needed was care. Yeah. Thank you. Um, James asks, how can parents and students of today continue the, pro the progress of the narrative of black culture and especially about the subject of women of color and the importance of their impact? Um, again, I, I think it's really important to look at um, how often Black women are not a part of the conversation and how important it is for Black women to be a part of the conversation. I, I was listening to Elizabeth Alexander talk about the specificity of language and how important it is to like to state something um, particularly, like to be as specific as you possibly can. Because when you're not, when you don't name black women, what you're in effect saying is that it's not okay to kill black men with impunity, but do what you will with black women. No, I think that's a, a very important thing you've touched on is specificity. Um, you know, it's it kind of all circles back to Kimberly Crenshaw and say her name, you know, this, this movement where you must speak the name. Um, it, it's powerful. Um, okay, from Emily. Uh, for your students and new artists, how did you develop your confidence, lose your fear as you go into the world and share your work and yourself with everyone? I attribute all of that to my students. Uh, I have become so like, <laughs> the decision to like to teach high school was like, was one of the best decisions I ever made. They are so brutally honest. They're like, they'll tell you like, what you're doing right now is not working. I don't get it. I don't, you know. Um, and I, I think the storytelling has become like a, a like I've kind of strengthened that part of it. Kids love to hear a story. Um, they like to feel that you're engaging with them. Um, I, I think that my, the way that I engage with audiences has grown a lot since, uh, I guess I started teaching in 2013, 2013, I think. So yeah, almost uh, eight, yeah, eight years now. Wow. So thank you Great. students, if you're listening. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, James asks, when networking as a person of color, have you ever felt that you have had to put on a new face or code switch in order to network more effectively? What advice might you have for other artists of color on staying grounded or having confidence in presenting yourself to others without needing to put on an entirely new face? Mm, man, that is like, that is such a struggle, James. Um... Wow, yeah, I mean, code switching is is real. Like it is like the the acrobatics that black people go through just to go about their daily lives if you're not in a um, completely black space. Um, I mean, there are different ways that I felt like, again, I'm at this intersection. I, I feel like there are ways in which, you know, I can't be, uh, not any, not any longer, but, there were ways where I couldn't be forthright about who I loved. Um, and there are certain, actually, I take that back. I mean, I would say that, yeah, that even exists today. I mean, I, I 
code switch as a queer woman. Like, like I think about like, you know, being on my honeymoon in uh, in Turkey and having to pretend that that you know that uh, you know my wife and I are just like buds traveling together. Um, there are a lot of ways that the code switching happens still. Um, there are, I like to think that most of the time I'm just like, I don't care, whatever. But then there are moments when like your life is on the line. Yeah. You know, I mean, I read some stories today. I read uh, a narrative today about these seven um, lesbian women who were um, raped by some men just because they were lesbians. PS, but some there are two Jameses asking these questions and I'm not sure if they're talking to each other. <laughs> so um, I'll try to ask one. Um, I think this is the question. Are there, are there ways that local artists can engage with DCPS students to create artwork to help build their own resumes? I mean, I, I do know that, um, I know that some of my most memorable experiences being uh, as a student at Duke Ellington was collaborating with like with outside artists who would come in and do these amazing projects with students. One of those one of those artists was uh, Tim Rollins in KOS. Um, that was crazy. I, I look back on that work that I that I made with him and in a lot of ways, that's like how I'm making work today. Um, so that's incredible. Um, but like, I, it sounds like maybe this question is more like, how do you get in touch or something like that? How do you get involved or? Yeah, maybe what the starting point would be. Mm, yeah, I would get in touch with the visual arts department. Uh, okay. at maybe at Duke Ellington, just like contact in the visual arts department. Um, there's also, I'm trying, oh man. Yeah, I don't know if I'm the right, actually, I, weirdly, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that question. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good place to start. Visual arts departments at the, oh, he says in a systemic way. Hmm. hmm. I see you, James, we can talk offline. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that might be a good idea. Um, well, you guys, we, we are at 7.20 um, and that about wraps up questions. Um, thank you so much, Nikisha and India for being with us tonight, um, for your work and your brilliance and expertise um, and sharing, sharing it with the Marymount University and DC community and beyond. Um, this has really just been so special. So thank you and thank you to Brooke um, I would encourage everybody to please fill out the survey that's in the chat that Brooke Berry placed. Um, it will, it'll help us get better at these things. Um, and also to let you know, Cody Gallery is open on Thursdays and Fridays from 10 to 5. Please come make an appointment to see Nikisha's exhibition, Magnolia. Um, you can email me at cberry at marymount.edu, and I'm happy to get you set up. Um, for Marymount ID card holders, you can come by any time during those opening hours. So please come see it in person. We'll have some more images up on our website soon. So thank you. Someone said the forum was locked. Just... Ah, <laughs> we'll fix that. Okay, <laughs> great. And we'll, since this, um, this talk has been recorded, this will go up on Cody's YouTube channel next week. And we will also include a link to the forum there as well. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hi, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs>